Thank you, Constantine. Well, uh, we're now to the discussion period, and uh, with some trepidation, I'd like to ask Ellie a question. So it, uh, if I understood you correctly, you said that uh, if you extract the excluded patients from the target population and compare what's left to the randomized trial, you may have uh, a more valid estimate uh, or ability to compare the treatment effect in the target population minus those that were excluded and the randomized trial. Did I hear you right? Uh, yeah, I think so. So um, I think that that's the classic um, question that we should be thinking about when we're comparing the outcomes from observational studies to randomized studies. Um, in the sense that um, when we see there's, if there's different results, so if, if the two sources of data are giving us different inference, then um, we need to think about um, why that is. And, and one reason why could be just the simple, the different population. And so if those two estimated, or the inferences from the two data sources are comparable, that gives us confidence that we've done a good job controlling confounders in um, the or controlling for confounding in the observational study and um, that we're answering the right question with, for, from the uh, randomized study. So the, if you then add back to that, after doing that step, you add back the excluded patients from the target population, um, are, is the, and, and you calculate a, an effect size, you're making, are you making then the assumption that that effect size applies to the target population? Yeah, so if you adjust for the, um, for the population using the data from the observational study, um, you can average over the effect um, in, in the two subpopulations and argue that that would be a reasonable um, estimate of the average effect size in the whole population. Um, of course, you're, you're making some big assumptions that you're not having an interaction effect, um, but when you're extrapolating, you're always assuming, right? One question I have before we uh, uh, turn to Sean. Uh, is it now standard practice for randomized trials to have an observational cohort that represented patients who uh, were excluded? So that, uh, uh, because I don't read about it in the trials that I, uh, I read in the New England Journal and JAMA annals. I'll answer that one, and Rob may want to comment as well the clinical for the clinical trialist. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, if anything, we're doing that less frequently now than, than, than we used to um, because of the financial um, of, of strain. So a great example of, of, of a trial that had a large registry was a CAS study performed in the late 1970s to uh, early, early 80s, um, <coughs> where there was a very large registry, and there were many, many papers that came out of that that um, registry that really broadened our understanding of the data within, within CAS. But that's become less common, um, I think largely fi for financial reasons, but also this, the, the pace at which we do things now is so fast, people move on to the next thing so fast that um, there isn't sort of that, that time for reflection. Thanks, Bill. Uh, uh, Rob? As a, I guess as a token trialist in this um, group, uh, um, the only group I know of that's doing it routinely is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons because they have a database of practically everyone that gets a, a cardiothoracic procedure in North America so that when you do a randomized trial, you use the data registry as your database and then you know exactly who um, in that population was and was not randomized. But I uh, also should mention in the collaboratory, which is an NIH project now ongoing, there are seven um, trials that are using electronic health records as the data, and certainly in that case, at least within the health systems that are participating, you should know everyone that was entered and everyone that was not. And I think one of the main points I wanted to make, which I heard Bill reiterate is that I think we're in sort of a, just sort of a mid midpoint now of um, chaos. I mean, as a trialist, everything I've heard so far would lead me to be very dubious about any um, observational um, result with an odds ratio less than two to three, just like I was before. But I think when we enter this era, uh, post pecori post everyone having an electronic health record, knowing the reference population from which it came, and extending randomized trials into much broader populations 
just going to be a different ball game. So in my view, we just got to live through this really agonizing period of time. Yeah. Rob, Rob, am I to infer that you, you would do all, say, pragmatic trials and would that, that your stance? I mean, hell, that was one of the reasons that I, I was trying to, at the very beginning, make the point that um, the place to start is, is not with pragmatic trials for therapies and probably for health systems interventions, too. I mean, if it works in Boston, it may not work in Durham. And so, um, you know, I think efficacy trials have a real use to uh, at least know that you have something to then go to the larger trial. But I think large, expensive, data-intensive randomized trials are going to be a thing of the past. And what we need to do is go from proof of concept to very broad, pragmatic trials that are inclusive and not um, excluding a bunch of people. It ought, people are randomized ought to be everyone for whom a reasonable practitioner would intend to use the treatment. Maybe at some point we can have a discussion uh, for the benefit of PCORI about how to uh, think about trials in the context of PCORI. But let's turn now to the audience. Sean Hennessy. Hi. Uh, Sean Hennessy from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, first, I wanted to ask a rhetorical question about uh, not believing observational studies if the uh, relative risk is less than three or two. Um, don't we have pretty good evidence that uh, the relative risk of breast cancer from using oral contraceptives is about 1.25? Um, and that's been repeated over and over, and everybody seems to believe that. Now, the question that I, I really want an answer to is uh, from Miguel. Um, you talked about um, using randomized trials to find out the effect of treatment in the people who took it. Um, and you mentioned as treated analyses. Isn't that a place, uh, the one place where we know that the instrumental variable is pretty good, randomization, and, and wouldn't we be better off using um, an IV approach uh, to analyzing the RCT to see the effect in the treated, and then F uh, after you're done answering that, uh, Bob Temple wants to tell us what his thoughts are on that. I'd love to hear that as well. Thank you, Sean. I, <clears throat> I need to step back for a second to answer that question because I think we are talking about different types of trials sometimes. I think that we, everyone in this, in this room, all things being equal, likes a trial better than an observational is, is type because we are not crazy people. <laughs> so <laughs> the... Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the, the issue is that for many questions that we have, um, either we, we don't have trials, we're never going to have trials, or the trials that we have are going to be so similar to observational studies that are going to be subject to the same kind of biases. Um, so that, that, is, that, is what, that is the context in which I was talking. Uh, if we are trying to find what's the best uh, strategy for Col for colonoscopy over a 10-year follow-up in people who may or may not have private symptoms, or sy that trial is going to be a is going to be very hard to do. There is going to be a lot of non-compliance. There is going to be a lot of loss of follow-up. Uh, if we want to get valid information from the trial, we better design it in such a way that we can at least try to adjust for things that happen during the follow-up, as as we would do in an observational study. Now, go going to your question, Sean. Um, so, uh, in s methods based on, based on instrumental variables have been used for decades and have been developed for very simple questions, essentially treatment A versus treatment B and with one outcome. There is no development of these methods, no practical way of using these methods for, very, for the complex questions that we are discussing here. So in a sense, a lot of the discussion about instrumental variables is moot because we cannot use them for uh, questions for like time varying treatments and, and f failure time, et cetera. The closest that we've gotten to that is the work that Jamie uh, has been done on that. And it's, not, it's, <coughs> it's, uh, it's fine in theory. We don't think it's ready for prime time. So. Instrumental variables, great for simple questions. Now, for a lot of the questions that we are asking, they are not going to be practical for a few years. Joe? Thanks. Thanks uh, to, to both of the presenters, really um, helpful uh, presentations. This question is for Ellie, and um, um, two parts. Uh, despite everything that's been said, we actually might, Picori may be tempted someday to uh, fund an observational study that extend, uh, attempts to extend findings 
from a randomized trial. And, and I wanted to ask Ellie two things. Number one, um, would it be reasonable to, um, to think, to speak with our reviewers about, to look for, you know, even uh, as we write solicitations, to ask if one is attempting uh, an observational study to extend findings from a randomized trial, to be certain to build in to the cohort that, uh, of the observational study that same group that was in the trial. So in other words, don't, that would be an advantage over simply doing a trial, doing an observational study in, s say, the excluded population. So in other words, if you're going to do a study, does this work in people over 65 given that uh, a trial showed that it worked in people under 65, should you calibrate your observational study by including a cohort under 65? Would that be a, would that be a good um, takeaway from your presentation? So, so my answer is it depends. <laughs> so um, I think that a, as the first uh, good observational uh, study of that problem, I would recommend, yes, that we want to have um, a lot of information on a wide range of patients. Um, as we move forward and collect more information about the same kind of problem, I think we need to take a step back and, and when we're design, designing our studies, think about where is the most information needed. And so um, I think that the concept of how to design future observational studies um, should depend on what's already available as well. Okay. And, and the second part of that is just, do you th and when you think about included and excluded populations, do you think any differently about people who are excluded by an exclusion criterion from people who are excluded by uh, refusing to participate? Yes, very much so. So um, the, the framework that I presented today was thinking only on exclusion criteria, but I think that we do definitely need to, to look at, um, I like to call them fuzzy uh, groups, but um, soft classification where, where you have a probability of being in the group. If I could just quickly comment on, on what you said, Joe. I mean, a tremendous advantage from my perspective of doing this through solicitations is um, it's bad enough in randomized trials to know who actually did which trials and whether they were reported. You know, thankfully with clinicaltrials.gov, we're beginning to make progress there. But one of the issues that bugs the heck out of me is when I read an observational study, I don't know how many other observationalists were out there asking the same question and not getting the result they wanted, so never told anybody about it. If you do this through solicitation, I hope you have the same rules for publication that um, clinicaltrials.gov has. Yes, we do. We do. And then I, I just also comment this thing about not uh, volunteering to participate, even though, you, as you know from, I think everybody in the room knows, that is a huge factor in prognosis uh, in most studies that have been able to look at it. In an observational study, I don't know how you can tell who would have volunteered and who wouldn't. It's an interesting problem. Miguel? I, I, I just want to say that I completely agree with you. I think that the main problem of observational studies is exactly what you said, is the selective reporting that might well be much more important than confounding or any of the other biases that we are discussing here. And if anyone in the audience has a way of starting to think about how to solve this problem, that would be a great outcome for this meeting. The, uh, Mitch? Yeah, I <coughs> uh, wanted to ask Ellie. I didn't hear much discussion of uh, the, the clinical trial itself as a source of information on generalizability. Because if you found that the treatment effects are fairly, uh, are homogeneous throughout the uh, study trial population, it doesn't, didn't depend on certain demographic characteristics and, and so forth, then you'd feel much more complicated, uh, 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 much more certain about um, generalizing the results uh, and the reweighting becomes simpler and a, a number, of, especially if you're trying to work on the absolute risk scale, uh, you, you, you could, uh, if you can find a scale of effect measurement w which, which is constant within a trial and if, and if the trial has broad enough representation to cover uh, the population, although not to the extent that it's represented in your target population, uh, you, you could uh, do a lot. So I, I just, I didn't hear much in your talk about uh, examination of, of heterogeneity of treatment effect within the trial itself as a major uh, factor in generalizability. 
Um, so you're right, I didn't talk much about that, and I would uh, ask some people that perhaps have more experience with more uh, broad types of randomized trial to, to uh, chime in on this. Um, I would feel better about generalizing from randomized tri uh, trials without any further evidence if the effect size seemed to be very homogeneous. Um, the way that I see the, the science right now is that we um, make that leap without much evidence. So what I was hoping um, that we would take away from the meeting today is that we really need more evidence about whether or not that's a realistic thing to do um, in, in different populations. There, there I have to be a little reactive. I mean, it was 25 years ago that Richard uh, Pito and his group, I mean, there are just tons of systematic overviews, and when you look at the um, relative treatment effect, it's unusual to find a subgroup that's different, and most of the time when you do, it's uh, random variation, because there are many examples now of people chasing um, blobograms where one subgroup went in the other direction, and almost all the time it turns out to be a false positive when it's chased down. There's a, there's a pretty substantial literature on this. Not to say it never happens, but, but the general, general rule, um, uh, Dave DeMetz and I wrote an article about this about 10 years ago, reviewed a lot of data, and it seems to hold up. Now, I think with molecular techniques, there may be differences now that emerge in ways we couldn't think about before. Bill? Let me put a caveat on the ca on the on the caveat uh, um, here because you're 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 right that that when you when you look at uh, the, the the forest plots things almost always line up on the on on the same side and when they don't usually there's random variation, but the problem is that's within within the structure of the trial itself and you really wonder about the generalizability of of that because there you really start getting far far away and and there the results really may not apply. Completely agree. For example, if trials were only done in China, would they apply? to U.S. patients, how would, how would we know? So is, is that rule of thumb that uh, homogeneity of effect size across subgroups predicts good um, um, gener external validity, is there, any, uh, is there any proof of that or is that just seen with common sense reasoning? That's definitely in the, in, in, in the maybe uh, category and it, it plays very much on, on, on Ellie's uh, uh, work about how you would go about that and the assumption that you're, that the, which I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it uh, uh, Kaiser's caveat from now on, that, that, the, that, that the, uh, the, the, the um, covariates will, will, will work and allow you to um, <coughs> uh, adjust for count confounding in the same way. It may not and I think the example of taking results of patients, patients in clinical trials who are not as sick and applying them to older patients with multiple comorbidities is where things may break down. Constantine, do you have any uh, comments on this point? Um, very interesting to uh, associate the, uh, the uh, homogeneity in the trial to the external homogeneity. I'm a little curious about uh, uh, how the homogeneity is, um, the, your comment that it's pretty much um, consistent that uh, there is homogeneity within the trial because the homogeneity depends also of course on how you measure the effect. So if there is homogeneity, let's say, in taking the difference uh, between outcomes, there will not be homogeneity in taking the ratio. So it's, it seems a little strange to me that uh, uh, that this would extend uh, across trials, especially if different trials have different me ways of measuring the effect. So, I mean, the standard uh, teaching is um, qu uh, quantitative interactions are common. So if you look at an absolute scale, of course, there's variation. Qualitative interactions are pretty unusual. So uh, when we talk about homogeneity, we're talking about relative effects, and we're talking about does the treatment actually go the opposite direction. If you okay. But, but what you say is right. Obviously, someone at a greater baseline risk, given the same relative treatment effect, is going to have a very different absolute um, benefit. Jamie? Hi. Um, I'm going to take the conservative position here, certainly. I, the old strategy of which people, at least some people seem to uh, suggest isn't good, of finding the people in a tr 
putting them in the trial who are most likely to get um, a treatment effect, you know, especially like doing things to find out who's going to be the compliers and so forth, and excluding other people seems to me a very good idea because as far as I understand it, though I'm not the expert, a high proportion of drugs they put into uh, phase three randomized trials fail. I mean, that's billions of dollars. That drug's good. You, want, you don't want it to fail because of some sort of heterogeneity and noncompliance because however you analyze noncompliance, A, you can't totally believe it, and B, you're not going to convince um, many people. In fact, I, um, and, you know, saying you should have all sorts of people in the uh, trial um, I, is, is much like, um, uh, in a certain way, because someone might not comply, it's very similar, actually, conceptually, to saying to people, you should only rely on an attempt to treat analysis. That would be like, for, you know, what the effect in the community is in, in planning. But if you look at the early HIV trials, everybody was suspicious of AZT and so forth. There was a lot of noncompliance. But when the drug, you know, when they put in the New York Times, break drug, the community that you were so worried about being noncompliant was not going to be compliant, noncompliant anymore. Mm. And, um, you know, so finding people who would hear in the first drug trial so you have power, I think is important, whatever effort it takes. So, Rob, do you want to comment on that? I mean, I, I think Bob Temple uh, taught me this, but, you know, one, one way I describe my career is most of it has been spent handing envelopes to people they didn't want to see because their best idea didn't work when it was really put to the test. So I think first, the first order of business is could the treatment possibly work, and the best way to find that out is with the most parsimonious trial. But what, part of what I was saying, though, is that I think if that's goal one, you ought to do that efficiently and effectively and then move on to goal two, which I argue in many cases will be a very large, pragmatic, uh, randomized clinical trial. But I do want to throw in here the one thing that several people have said I completely agree with. And Steve Goodman was Goodman is a person I always quote. You may have copied it from someone else with that statement that a chronic clinical trial is an observational study with randomization on day one, which I've heard multiple variations on. And for some reason, I'm now involved in a number of these trials um, where if you study old people with comorbidities, Bill, as you point out, a lot of them are going to come off treatment at various times. You know that. And um, we're not very good at putting together credible analyses that carry the day. I think we, we did with the rivaroxaban trial that just got through the FDA, but it was hard sledding when you try to apply um, uh, more complex analyses to post-randomization data. Uh, Miguel, perhaps I could ask you to comment on the point that you raised over and over again in, during your presentation about the need for controlling for time-varying confounders and so forth down the line. Is that common practice now, is the analysis, or is that something you're hoping for? Uh, it's not common practice for trials. Hmm? I'm sorry? <clears throat> It is not common practice for, for trials, but also linking with uh, what Jamie said and what Rob said. Um, if we are talking about phase three pre-market trials, I agree with both things that you are saying. If we are talking about trials that are about drugs already in the market where we are trying to fine tune how to use the drugs, we don't want to know that this antiretroviral therapy, whether this antiretroviral therapy works or, or not. We know that it works. Now we're asking questions of the type of, okay, which is the best combination of drugs we can start with? When is the optimal time to start that drug during the natural history of the disease? When is the optimal time to switch to, to, switch to a different combination of drugs? And what is the optimal combination of drugs to switch to? Once we start asking those questions, which I think are going to be the most important questions in comparative effectiveness research in the next few years, then trials uh, lose their position at the top of the, of the designs because they are going to be, again, subject to all these problems. That you, are, you, are, you are not going to have a thousand of arms in the trials with all possible combinations. There is going to be time-varying confounding. There are going to be laws to follow up. That is when, when, uh, when, when, when these methods and this approach that I, I was discussing um, it starts to make sense. Not for short, mm -hmm. highly controlled, in selected patients phase three trials. 
Got it. Thank you. Next, please. Could you identify yourself? Yes. So we have uh, two questions from the web. Uh, the first is from Willie Valencia at the Miami VA Geriatric Research and Clinical or Ge Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center. He says, absolutely fascinating concepts regarding the external validity of observational studies while questioning the better truth that would be expected from RCTs. In the end, how would this external validity impact the concept of the pyramid of evidence? And then the second is from John Kai with AstraZeneca. How do we generalize treatment? Well, why don't we let oh, the, you want to do the first one? deal with this okay. one? So who would like to comment on the first question? The pyramid of evidence. I thought that was off limits. <laughs> well, I'm sure everybody knows what I think already. I mean, if you ha if you can get randomized trial evidence, that that has to be um, the best if you can get it. But at the the points we made, you often can't get it, and um, then you have to uh, do with the best you can. And then I think the point we're talking about in this session: uh, what do you do with 90 year old? people, um, I don't think there is a pyramid in that group yet. I'm arguing that we ought to randomize within those groups, <laughs> but we don't have it now. Others made, uh, you know, m many people argue talking about the pyramid is a waste of time these days because you need both. Yeah. Okay, go on to question or two, please. Yeah, yes. Um, so John Kai with Astra AstraZeneca asks, how do we generalize treatment profiles and randomized trials, which we know are quite different from real world treatment pathways? These are not static variables, but differences in sequence of events or frequency of events, which may cause different outcomes in study re results. <coughs> this is an opening for me to remind everybody that we're in a crisis right now because of the neonatal intensive care unit network trial, which uh, one of the really fascinating parts of that trial, they randomized the two targets for oxygen saturation and neonates, got the opposite result of what all the practitioners thought from the observational data too, I might um, add just to throw in a little job there. <laughs> but, but one of the really fascinating parts was when they looked at the neonates who were not enrolled, they had a, had a higher mortality than the worst arm of, um, of the clinical trial. And um, it, it, to me, it, it, you know, it's possible it's because they were just different, that's highly likely. But it could also be that um, whatever other treatments were going on outside of a protocolized, randomized trial were not only more variable, but also worse. And so um, I think it's a real issue that's hard to um, understand. And the extreme example we deal with now in global trials is diets and medicinal herbs are so different from country to country, it can have a huge effect in ways that are unmeasurable right now. Thank you. Bob Temple? <clears throat> I have about 60 notes to myself. I'm not sure what, <laughs> sure what to pick. Um, w one, just one, one observation is what, is what uh, Mitch raised before. Um, any, large, any large trial has a broad range of people. They're always doing forest plots and meta, you know, in, their, in their overall analyses. So you can always get some idea if there are major differences from one group to the other, almost always. What's also true is that you don't see forest plots or those analyses for symptomatic treatments. Um, actually, we're writing guidance that encourages people to take a look at that. You'll see demographic uh, a subset analyses because they're required by law. But, but other than that, you really won't see them. And that's a place to look because there could be differences in how people respond to an antidepressant based on some baseline factor. Another observation is that it's tempting to include compliance in the observational data, but we have evidence from some controlled trials that compliance predicts good outcomes even in the placebo group, so you've got to be extremely careful about doing that, and I would uh, be invariably suspicious. Um, the, the, the next thing, though, is about this if efficacy versus effectiveness question, and I don't have a good sense, maybe it's because I'm not in that business, of the things people are most worried about. Um, uh, I mean, are there really conspicuous examples where real world effects were just missing when the drug looked really great in the efficacy trials? What particular things are we worried about? Because if we could identify them, we could look for them in various places. I don't know, we could look harder at compliance and see whether that predicts in the trials and see whether that's going to make a difference and all kinds of things uh, like that. But I don't have any sense of what people think we're missing. and. You know, from this morning's observation, 
unless the difference is very large, you're not going to see it credibly. I mean, the effect size of most drugs is maybe 20%, 30%, so the difference between one treatment and another is going to be at most half of that. We're talking about hazard ratios of 0.9 or you know, 1.1, depending on how you put it. How are we going to pick those out of observational studies? Does anybody really believe that? But in any case, it seems very worthwhile defining what experience has told us and what are the main things we're uh, mostly worried about. So, so any uh, any responses to Bob's comments? I, I'm I'm not sure this is a response to your comments, but there's a reaction. Um, well, th there are some examples in which <clears throat> this issue of effectiveness versus efficacy may not be clear. What do we mean? Um, in the example that I gave was actually safety, it wasn't efficacy, but I, I gave you an example in which an intention to treat is 1.2 and, an, and a, a, part, a, a not um, fully controlled for per protocol was 1.6. That's, that's a huge difference for safety and for any cost effectiveness analysis or cost benefit analysis that you are going to do is something to take in, into account. So that is an example in which the intention to treat, which is what most people think measures effectiveness, um, is giving you something that may not be what you want to put in your cost effectiveness models or to tell your patients. From the point of view of more an effectiveness example, think of this trial that I, I was referring to earlier. People are randomized to either a colonoscopy or no colonoscopy at baseline and followed for 10 years. This is a trial that is happening in Europe now. Um, in some countries, the compliance with colonoscopy is 20%, um, which is not very surprising. The trial is going on and it will have an intention to treat analysis for the effectiveness of, col of colonoscopy. The effect of colonoscopy has to be huge to be able to find anything with a 20% mm -hmm compliance. Um, still, the trial is on and the primary analysis is an intention to treat analysis. Is that measuring the effectiveness? Some people will say yes because that's really what, that's the proportion of people who are willing to have a colonoscopy. Well, as Jamie was saying, that's the proportion of people who are willing to have a colonoscopy because they don't know whether it works or not. If they knew that it works, maybe it wouldn't be 20%, it would be 60% and the effectiveness would be completely different. So intention to treat Clearly, it's not a measure of effectiveness, it's a measure of the assignment to treatment in, in some circumstances at one point in time. Um, the only way that, um, that, that you can a answer these questions and try to answer these questions is by trying to control for things that affect compliance and also affect the, the risk of the outcome in this case. Um, and observational studies may fail at doing that, but the randomized trial may also fail at doing that by trying, we are, we are going to get possibly closer to the truth than if we don't try. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm very sympathetic to that. I don't think ITT is always the best measure of what the effect was. We actually use it as a threshold. Uh, if you pass that, then we're sure there's no informative censoring, but that still might not be the best uh, data to put down. For what it's worth, in non-inferiority studies and safety studies, we ask for the as treat because we know intent to treat blurs the, uh, blurs the effect size. So I think we should move on to the next uh, questioner, Steve Goodman. Uh, one question, uh, well, two. First is, um, it, it seems to me that there's, the query is about, uh, you know, subsidizing, paying for research that, on outcomes that people care about. And, and they care about simultaneously the benefits and the harms. And, and even though, and a lot of the, the lore and the, the wisdom that's been handed down on the issues of heterogeneity and extrapolation have to do for the most part with, with the benefits only. And if, if you start considering the frequencies of harms, then this issue of absolute versus relative risk plays a big, huge role because um, it has to surpass not just some degree of, you know, does it work, but does it work well enough to withstand the harms and the, har and the determination of the harms is often factors that are completely different than those that predict the benefits. And, and uh, taking out people with a lot of comorbidities and, and things like that really changes the equation. So every clinician knows that they don't give drugs that are sometimes they know to be effective by the book because they know that the patient either can't tolerate uh, the side effects or the patient actively chooses not to take it simply because they don't want to live, you know, four months of misery. They'd rather live for three months uh, uh, free of that treatment. So it seems to me that there has to be more sophisticated 
modeling and conversation of benefits and harms simultaneously, because otherwise this is some one step removed from, from the clinic. And um, well, I'll just, just leave it at that and maybe get your reaction. And the second question I'd, so I'd like is, same one I asked before, if Pecori is going to invest in methods development in this area, aside from your own work or in addition to your own work, and anybody can comment on this, where do you think they're going to get the biggest bang for their buck? So two questions. Maybe I could take a, a, a look at the first one. The notion of modeling made my ears perk up. The, uh, there was a study published in the New England Journal in, in August, uh, a, a sort of a reanalysis of using mostly data from the European stu randomized study of prostate cancer screening, but utilities taken from uh, the published literature. Um, and they calculated the quality adjusted life years, the healthy years gained, and they had a distribution that crossed zero and went into the negative, mostly as near as you could tell, the distribution was skewed toward the positive. But that would be an example of trying to bring the harms and benefits together in a way that in the, same patients, the editorialist, right. which was me, thought was really exciting. <laughs> Second question? Well, they can talk about the first one. Oh, the first one. one. Yes. You might. Uh, I, I completely agree with you that when you begin to look at benefit-risk balance, um, the, the homogeneity goes away in some cases, and I think it's mostly in the group that Bill identified, the multiple comorbidity group. I'll, you know, you've made me feel good because the rocket trial, um, the, the one I talked about, you know, it passed Temple's threshold by ITT for non-inferiority, but um, it turned out there were so many people on and off drug and there were so many people over age 80 with comorbidities, it was pretty rich data. And it was, uh, and we had utility data about intracranial hemorrhage versus, um, and, and bleeding versus uh, embolic outcomes. And the balance in that case ended up looking more favorable for the new drug than just the um, initial ITT um, analysis. So I think there, and that's part of my answer to number two is, I, I think this issue of even within randomized trials, what do you do after day one? I, I would hope there will be investment in that question because it's going to come up more and more because more of the trials are going to be chronic and have all the same issues. So, so before we go on, I need to uh, do a quick time check. Are we supposed to be done at 2.15 or 2.30? 2.15? In that case, it's 2.15. So let's thank the panelists for a great uh, appreciation.